That'd be great. All right, well, thanks everybody um, for coming. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I have to, uh, so keep me, uh, keep me on time. I have to get Paul to Edina later this morning. So uh, uh, we're gonna, uh, this is gonna be kind of a rapid fire uh, session. So if I speak uh, really fast, uh, I apologize. Uh, I have a, uh, several areas that I wanted to cover kind of to give you an idea of what's going on in the electrophysiology section. And uh, so uh, I ha have no disclosures. The, uh, the main question that we hope to address today is how do we advance the field of cardiac electrophysiology at Minneapolis Heart Institute? And uh, what we have is a mix of industry and investigator-initiated studies, a large volume of complex clinical electrophysiology management, and an extraordinary research support staff and infrastructure. So when you made all of that together, we really have fantastic opportunities to provide state-of-the-art research and clinical care for our patients. So it's really, uh, um, I hope you'll find that this is uh, really exciting and, uh, and uh, very interesting. So I've, I've kind of divided the areas into uh, different sections. So uh, we'll start off with complex arrhythmia and ablation and move on to device science and safety, device therapy innovation, and then the genetic arrhythmia center. So when we think of uh, complex uh, arrhythmias, you know, atrial fibrillation comes to the top of that list. And as you know, the scope is huge. Uh, it's an epidemic. You know, there are up to 6 million individuals in the United States with atrial fibrillation. This is expected to double by 2030. Uh, it's interesting to note that 9% of people above the age of 65 have atrial fibrillation. And, and this is based on older data. Uh, so uh, the cl clear need for advanced therapies, advanced public health initiatives is, is critically needed. Uh, to improve our, uh, our goals in this, in this realm. And when we think of the procedure itself, what are our goals? Well, we want to improve, improve our ability to ablate, the safety, the efficacy. And so the, the path that we've taken uh, through our research is to try to better understand these atrial fibrillation mechanisms uh, and to uh, improve on our tools and, and mapping technologies to uh, improve the success rate, prevent recurrent atrial arrhythmias, and expand the pool of ablation candidates, uh, uh, patients who are older, patients who are more frail, and make this feasible in those patients. And then from a public health standpoint, it's to identify patients at risk and reduce morbidity and mortality. So with respect to atrial fibrillation mechanisms, it's been almost uh, two decades now uh, since uh, the pioneering discovery with respect to uh, pulmonary veins and, and how they play a role in atrial fibrillation. That these structures within, uh, that come off the left atrium have electrical sleeves that trigger atrial fibrillation and that ablation around those pulmonary veins can lead to significant Im improvement and, and uh, treatment of atrial fibrillation, particularly paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. But what's come to li uh, light, and everybody's quite aware of this, is that with more persistent forms of atrial fibrillation, we know that there's something beyond the pulmonary veins that we have to target. These patients have ultra-structural changes in their left atrium, left atrium's large, dilated, fibrosis, and refractory to, to pulmonary vein isolation, to medical therapy. So their long-term outcomes are not as good. And so in the last several years, people have been very focused on identifying other drivers of atrial fibrillation that exist outside of those pulmonary veins. And uh, that mapping technology has been controversial, um, but in our own practice, Dr. Melby has been a pioneer in this field. Through our current mapping system and our technologies, he's identified additional areas, localized AFib drivers, that have proven to be beneficial in targeting uh, persistent atrial fibrillation. So what I have here depicted for you in the slide is an example of a uh, the shell of a left atrium that we've created with a mapping catheter inside the left atrium. This is called the penaray catheter. And the electrodes along this catheter are showing you regions of high frequency activation. And this activation, this patient is in atrial fibrillation, but the frequency of this activation is much faster than surrounding areas. And it's interesting that we can find these reproducible areas in a, what you would think a complex chaotic arrhythmia, but consistently in different patients. And they're in different regions of the left atrium, uh, and sometimes even in the right atrium. But when we target these areas, we've found that we improve the conversion rate of atrial fibrillation intraprocedurally, 
And we also improve the freedom from atrial fibrillation when compared to our standard approach, which would be a stepwise ablation as we target different structures in the left atrium, the roof, the posterior wall, in addition to the pulmonary veins. So much more to come on these types of techniques. As part of developing those uh, techniques and that software to identify those regions, we work very closely with industry uh, with their next generation of tools. We're often uh, the site to beta test their products and develop this software for mapping with the industry leaders. And uh, for that reason, uh, we have the uh, ability to use their tools and, and develop those tools along with them. And uh, for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, uh, of one particular tool that, is, uh, that you may have heard of that has come up recently with a lot of attention is uh, a catheter that provides high power, short duration ablation. So currently, when we do pulmonary vein isolation for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, we're typically ablating at about 35 watts for a certain period of time and contact force because our catheter can tell us exactly how much energy, how much force, and how potentially how deep those lesions are in the left atrium. And we actually have a study to assess what the optimal ablation uh, time and power and, and force is. But this catheter, instead of delivering 35 watts, delivers 90 watts and does it for four seconds and uh, at a time. So basically, we can work our way around the left atrium. And, uh, and what the feasibility studies have shown that this uh, procedure, this particular catheter, has reduced the uh, total procedure time uh, essentially in half. I mean, almost uh, uh, even better than that. Uh, whereas right now, two to three hours for an AFib ablation, uh, the average time in the studies with this particular catheter was about an hour and a half. Um, total ablation time is uh, cut in a third. And uh, fluoroscopy time, which already is very low, almost we can do this procedure without any fluoroscopy. But in the study, uh, they had about six minutes, whereas uh, the average was about 18 minutes or so with uh, the, the standard technique. So uh, a catheter that potentially we know can improve uh, uh, procedure times uh, with similar uh, uh, safety. And what remains to be seen, and, and that's the multicenter study that we've been involved with, with the QDOT, is to evaluate the safety and effectiveness with, in long term outcomes in patients with pulmonary vein isolation. So uh, much more to come with, with this catheter and many more that are being developed um, to, to target uh, this, this condition. So I want to put this in context uh, to kind of show something that we do that really no place else can do. And uh, because it's basically because we have a system that no one else has. So uh, the, the latest version of the CARDO mapping system from Biosense, uh, version 7, is something that, that Cleveland doesn't have, Mayo doesn't have, Boston doesn't have. And I wanted to kind of present this case to show you um, how, it, how it's been helpful. So here's a 58-year-old female with a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy attributed to adriamycin therapy. And there's thought to be a component of tachy-mediated uh, cardiomyopathy. So historically, her EF was about 35 to 43%. And uh, recently, she's admitted uh, with worsening LV function and severe mitral regurgitation. And she uh, keeps presenting with a rapid uh, narrow complex tachycardia up to 200 beats per minute. We suspect that this tachycardia is an atypical left atrial flutter. And uh, part of the reason for that is that she's had two prior ablations, 2017 for AFib, and later that year, she had another ablation for an atypical flutter uh, post-ablation. She's done well for about two years, but recently she's been more decompensated, uh, relatively frail. Uh, she has a history of stroke, hypertension, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, and uh, with our, the help of our wonderful advanced heart failure colleagues, she's been optimized with medical therapy and uh, recently cardioverted, but she continues to present with uh, rapid episodes of tachycardia. So here's her EKG. And then the next step uh, is posed to you as to whether we would consider at this point repeat catheter ablation. AV node ablation and pacing, uh, mitral clip possibly, or advanced heart failure options? And likely the answer is some combination of all of the above going forward. But really, we want to deal with this tachycardia first as, as, as best as possible. So this is a, a patient I brought to the lab. I want to show you what we found. So this is, again, using that mapping system, the CARDO version 7. And uh, what I've done here is create an electroanatomic map within the left atrium. And uh, there's two parts of this map. So one is an activation map that shows the relative propagation of the tachycardia. And what you're looking at is the anterior septal aspect of the left atrium. This is the right superior pulmonary vein, this is the roof, anterior wall, and down here is the mitral annulus. And on this side, what we have is a bipolar map demonstrating the scar. And so red is all uh, scar tissue. And so this is a combination of her previous ablation 
as well as um, uh, the atrial cardiomyopathy that she's developed over time related to her underlying uh, heart failure and condition. So you see that the system is actually telling us that the tachycardia is propagating through this area, even though there's tremendous endocardial scar in that segment. And this is what's depicted here with this particular map. And you might wonder, well, how is that possible? So lately, we, we have this increased understanding of epicardial bundles uh, and, and potentially epicardial jumps. And if this is true, if this is accurate, what it means is that if we go to this critical isthmus right here and target this, that should be uh, sufficient to terminate this uh, tachycardia. And so what I've shown you here, sorry about that, in the bottom slide, is the tachycardia itself. So this is the atrial electrograms and uh, the atrium is going about 190 beats per minute. And we have our ablation catheter, which is in yellow at the side of, of this critical isthmus, which is uh, depicted on the map up here. And there's no signal because on the endocardial surface, it's all scar. And with a deep ablation in that region, just from the understanding that the system allows us to, to understand this tachycardia, we see that the tachycardia slows and terminates. And as an electrophysiologist, that feeling never gets old. When you terminate a rapid tachycardia in the lab, it's, it's, it's fantastic. So this patient has done quite well. She recently saw Dr. Zimbo in clinic. Uh, no recurrent uh, tachyarrhythmias. Uh, echo, repeat echo is pending. But clearly, there's going to be need for more advanced options down the road. But this is something that we're able to do. So oftentimes, we get this, uh, these referrals for AV node ablation and pacing. And it, it really needs to be said that now our technology is such that you know, ablation, uh, uh, in this case, it was a third ablation, a couple years after her first two, has, is, can, continues to be successful. And the same would be true if this patient was in her 70s or 80s as well. Yeah, the, smiley face. Uh, the smiley face, yes, yes, the cardinal. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Successful ablation. <laughs> so I'm going to shift a, a little bit from ablation to uh, another area, and that's stroke risk. And this is a very important study that's ongoing that's currently enrolling. Dr. Moore is the uh, primary investigator. It's called the Artesia study. I, I remember Artesia because I grew up in a small town in southeastern New Mexico called Carlsbad, and I ended up in Cleveland. And uh, one of the heart failure specialists, he was from a town called Artesia, which is a small oil town in southeastern Mexico, like 5,000 people live there. And we both ended up in Cleveland, but he would, he would remind me every week how Artesia would always beat Carlsbad in Friday night uh, football. So uh, that's, uh, this, this, uh, this study is very easy to remember for me. So it's the apixaban uh, for the reduction of thromboembolism in patients with device-detected subclinical AFib. And so you've all had that phone call from our pacemaker nurses or uh, from someone saying, oh, hey, we've picked up 12 minutes of atrial fibrillation on this pacemaker check. She's never had AFib before, completely asymptomatic. What would you like to do? And uh, often you may look at the CHADS2 VAS score. Uh, you might consider AFib, we'll just keep watching. Uh, you might consider anticoagulation. We don't know yet. So, so as long as the episodes are relatively short, uh, the patients can be uh, randomized to either a Pixivan or aspirin. Uh, based on their CHADS2 VAS score, they get entry into this. And this, this study is going to be very important because it's going to uh, allow us to uh, understand the impact of subclinical AFib. Is it really associated with an increased risk of stroke? Uh, and it's going to help uh, these two groups uh, that currently exist sort their differences because there are a group out there that feel that atrial fibrillation by itself is just a marker of increased risk of stroke. And then there's another group that feel that you really do have to have a causal temporal relationship with having AFib and stroke. And so this is a very important study going forward. So just something to remember when you, when you get that phone call about your uh, patient having AFib detected um, um, incidentally. So we actually thought about this in another population, in the TAVR population, a while back, because we were trying to identify whether or not uh, what the utilization rate of pacemakers was, was in all our patients who received pacemakers after TAVR. And what we kept coming across when we looked at their device checks was a lot of atrial fibrillation. And this would be months or a year after their TAVR. And Mike Magali, uh, one of our wonderful fellows, took this project on and uh, presented this at HRS, has published it now, um, which identified that there were about 25% of patients who uh, developed AFib and flutter. And this is not post-operative, uh, post-procedural, AFib, but rather long-term uh, follow-up with their pacemaker. And about 14.5% were subclinical AFib. And then the question was whether or not that was associated with a higher risk of stroke. And there was a signal that it was. So it tells us that in these other populations, which is not completely surprising, we're probably underestimating the incidence of atrial fibrillation and that, the, that there is a 
critical need to monitor these patients much more closely. And that's something we hope to work with our structural partners on. So I'm going to shift uh, gears a little bit. So we talked a little bit about complex ablation, some of the studies and uh, technologies that we're using for that. And I want to focus a little bit on device safety and patient safety with devices, because this is something that's been near and dear to MHI for many, many years. Uh, Dr. Gornick, Dr. Hauser, Dr. Abdahadi, uh, Dr. Katsianis, they've all been involved, and Dr. Omquist, of course, uh, have all been involved with studies over the years that have really shed light on um, a device uh, safety advisories and, and failures that uh, needed to be addressed by the FDA and industry. And um, it, what's common to all of these, whether it's the Riata lead, the Fidelis lead, uh, these are infamous names probably in, in, the, in the audience, was that whenever they came out with these, uh, 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 these articles saying that there are issues with these uh, leads, the one thing that was consistent was resistance from the community saying, you know, that's, that can't be the case, or this is not the case. You're only seeing it in Minneapolis. I don't know what uh, uh, you know, you're doing up in Minneapolis. But it wasn't that. It was that we were seeing it before anybody else was. And we'll talk a little bit about why that could be the case. But, um, so we have big shoes to fill when it comes to lead safety and, and device. But um, you know, with Dr. Hauser's input, we've, we've done pretty well recently. So uh, you know, we've identified that uh, there's a concern with the Drata lead. This was published in Heart Rhythm this last year, one of the most read articles in Heart Rhythm. And it has uh, presented by our, our wonderful fellow Moses at HRS. And, um, it has to do with internal insulation breaches found in this defibrillator lead that may have led to the inability to uh, uh, shock or convert ventricular tachycardia in several, episodes, uh, several events and uh, identified through the MOD database by Dr. Hauser. And um, so uh, definitely a concern about this lead that was shared uh, by e electrophysiologists all over the world. And then we uh, have an article in, uh, that's accepted with revision, so I can't talk uh, much about it, but uh, in the next uh, week, few weeks, uh, look out for this. Uh, another uh, device safety issue that we identified that uh, where we feel industry and the FDA should have played more of a role because we feel there could have been morbidity and mortality that could have been prevented. And this is soon to be published. Uh, so I won't talk too much more about that. Um, but why are we able to identify this? So uh, our device clinic with more than 25,000 patient visits uh, annually uh, and our wonderful pacemaker nurses are really at the forefront of this because they are phen phenomenal at identifying patient device safety issues and they take this very seriously. And so we want to, so far we've been transitioning to an electronic database and our goal is to partner with the HDI to leverage this large volume data to advance patient care and help with early recognition of these safety concerns. And so, and we have a very large population and we have a very high percentage of follow-up in that population. And I think that's something that we don't find in other large institutions that are similar. And so we have really an advantage when it comes to picking, detecting these signals. And, uh, uh, and so there's much more to come uh, going forward in that, in that field. We like to, and the quality of our device program attracts industry studies and innovative technology. And so I wanted to share some of that technology with you. Um, you know, as you all know, the Micra, a leadless implantable pacemaker by Medtronic, it, yes, it is really that small. Uh, it, the second in the country, first in the Midwest, was implanted by Dr. Gornick at our institution. Uh, also, the subcutaneous ICD manufactured by Boston Scientific, the first person in Minnesota to get it. Also, Dr. Gornick implanted this back in 2012, so seven years ago. And then uh, lately, quadrupolar lead technology for cardiac resynchronization therapy. Uh, we've, I was a PI recently on, a, on an important study with Medtronic uh, for the Attain Stability Lead, which is a, a novel lead that's soon to be released by the FDA. Um, and going forward, this is a, a new technology for a defibrillator that we're gonna have. So this particular subcutaneous system, uh, similar to the Boston Scientific System, lays here uh, in the axilla, but the lead is gonna be tunneled. And what we are gonna do as electrophysiologists is tunnel this intrathoracically actually underneath the sternum. So in addition to providing defibrillation therapy, we're gonna be able to find and provide anti-tachycardia pacing with this device uh, without a intravascular system. So again, an advantage for younger uh, patients who we'd rather avoid the lead-related complications from having an intravascular system. So this is a pivotal study that we'll be involved with in, in the coming uh, months. So uh, I do want to send, before I finish, uh, a, a couple minutes with this uh, particular aspect of our electrophysiology section, the Genetic Arrhythmia Center, because um, you know, Dr. Katsianis and Dr. Abdadi established this, and it's really helped to revolutionize the care of, of patients who have a predisposition to sudden cardiac death, and of course, family members of victims. And so what we have is a sudden cardiac arrest network that was uh, uh, put together with 
um, the medical examiners, uh, pathologists, and with our own uh, uh, teams, uh, multidisciplinary teams, including imaging and heart failure and uh, genetic counseling. And uh, we have a collaborative multidisciplinary clinic where we take care of these patients. And as a result, we have a clinical registry that allows us to uh, identify novel genetic mutations associated with these rare heritable conditions. So this is a, a publication that we have from identifying a new mutation related to that was disease causing associated with arrhythmogenic uh, right ventricular cardiomyopathy. And um, it's not a week that goes by or a month that goes by really when we're in clinic that we do identify these novel mutations and we, we get information that we don't know whether this mutation is disease causing or not. But through the study of large families uh, of, of these uh, patients, we can potentially demonstrate whether or not the mutation segregates with the condition and, uh, and, and identify these mutations uh, so that uh, other family members can be screened. And, and I remember it, it's, not a, it's not an easy, when I first uh, started in the GAC clinic, it, it's, it's very difficult to have these conversations with patients. And uh, in this particular family, the parents uh, of the, the deceased, uh, um, you know, they were very, willing to participate with us to allow us to identify uh, this uh, mutation and they really wanted the copy of the article after they were done as a, as a form kind of answers and closure uh, and uh, it, so it's very rewarding to to be in that uh, that's uh, uh, in this part of uh, this type of clinic to help these uh, people understand um, it, and there are very uh, rare conditions that we're continuing to identify. Uh, we have families now with uh, malignant early repolarization syndrome, uh, malignant mitral valve prolapse syndrome that we're assessing. And then uh, you can notice, you notice here I, I'm terming it arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy and not ARVC because as we see more and more of these patients and through our projects from, from the summer interns, we, we're understanding that this is also a left ventricular phenotype uh, approximately in about 40 to 50% of patients. And so that often goes under-recognized. So it's a, really an opportunity uh, to learn more uh, about that, those rare conditions. So a word of thanks, without uh, our wonderful electrophysiology section, all the members and the device clinic nurses, this would not be possible. Uh, Sue, Christine, Jacob, Andrew, uh, Mike Magali, uh, and uh, everybody in the foundation, Ross and Larissa, uh, thank you very much uh, for all your help and all you do to help uh, us with these uh, uh, amazing projects. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Mario. You wrote a great work. Um, Ryan and I had a similar case recently where there was paroxysmal atrial something, whatever you guys call it, and uh, TR and MR, and a patient was headed toward some sort of major surgery or whatever we can do to enhance it. And I asked Ryan to uh, ablate it. And then, you know, she came back just a month later or two, and the MR was from. Yeah. Here to kind of manage moderate. I'm sure we can even do better if we watch the medication. And I saw your uh, mapping, you know, this concept of atrial MR. So I was wondering, do you think that we could look at your maps and see if that um, pattern of, of atrial tachycardia tachy is related to the atrial dilation and scarring? A absolutely. It's a great, great point. And we, we feel that there are probably different phenotypes, but there are sub sub phenotypes where it is like what you're describing, where there's an atrial MR, uh, some, sometimes it's a chicken and the egg, but we can probably better assess. And when we're in the left atrium, we're assessing hemodynamics, we're getting a, a scar burden. Uh, we also have all the data from the MR. So we can really better classify these patients and truly understand the atrial cardiomyopathy. And ultimately that can lead to better therapies in the future. I think that's a, it's a tremendous opportunity to, to better uh, treat these patients. And, and what you're seeing with respect to the MR and TR, we see that all the time. We see EF improved, valve function improved with ablation. And so that's why, you know, just AV node ablation and pacing is kind of a workaround that really over time we feel is not going to be the best solution for these patients. Even if it's the third ablation, now we can do much more and have much better success going forward. So always something to think about when you're referring these patients and, and the, the, the ablation of their arrhythmia, targeting that arrhythmia is critically important. Just a comment about that. If you think about the mitral and trimester valves are integral not only to closing blood flow between the atrium and the ventricles, but they're also really important structural things, right? Going through the papillary muscles and the chorion. So depending on how the ventricles are electrically activated and also depending on 
it was that the heart gets a little dilated or whatever because it's in a rapid arrhythmia is actually critical. You know, it's not, it's just not a door opening and closing. It's a, as you tell us, no, they're, they're very complicated structures involved in this thing. They're, they're, they're essentially the two by fours of the ventricle. Sure. Yeah, yeah. With the entrance tachycardia, especially in the ventricle, there are low frequency signals and maintenance activity that we should look for and we try to interrupt it. Yeah. In this case, you speak call it high frequency, so I'm trying to understand that. Yeah. So it's it's a different uh, entity, uh, most likely. So some in the in this uh, ventricle, when we're thinking about fibrosis and scar mediated reentry tachycardia, this may be a little different because this may not always exist in areas of fibrosis, it, it may or may not. But there are areas that, that uh, functionally could represent electric uh, rotors or drivers of atrial fibrillation. Now it's not clear that what we're mapping with the high frequency ripple activation is the same thing as a rotor. They're, they're different, they potentially are, uh, could be different mechanisms. But what we've identified with this technique are that there are localized regions of this particular finding that can then, targeting those in addition to the pulmonary veins can lead to effectiveness uh, beyond just pulmonary vein isolation. Whether it's the same, there's a lot of uh, uh, argument about that. And rotors are typically these fixed uh, areas in the atrium, and they're probably very different from what we see in the ventricle with respect to uh, scar-mediated VT and reentry. All right, all right. Thanks very much. Thank you. Oh, sure, sorry. <laughs> <Need> this. <laughs> Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me. I think that this mic is for everyone else, but except for the people in the room, right? Sorry. Where does it go? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, it's backwards. There okay. Yeah. No problem. How's that? Very good. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. So in the next 15 to 20 minutes, I'm going to give you uh, an update on structural heart disease. And I'm going to talk about five patients with four messages uh, that I want to go over. And uh, these are the four messages I'd like for you to keep in mind. You know, first, uh, when it comes to patients with shortness of breath, we really have new ways of diagnosing and treating these patients. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, secondly, uh, the field of tricuspid regurgitation in terms of transcatheter options has really just started to explode. And I'm going to share with you a couple of things that we're doing here uh, at uh, NMHI in the foundation. And then third, uh, many of you are aware of our tendine and MAC or severe mitral annual calcification experience. And I'm going to give you an update as to where that's are right now. And then the fourth message is that when it comes to transcatheter mitral therapy, I'm gonna give you a glimpse into the future, and that future will involve our ability to do both repair and replacement, and even replace those patients who've been previously repaired. And so, so with that in mind, um, I'm gonna first start out with this. So does anybody here know where these pictures are from? Anybody venture to guess? Come on, somebody's got to know. Minnesota. Not Minnesota. <laughs> Route 66 doesn't go through Minnesota. Okay. Close. Really? Yeah, it's close to New Mexico. It's close. It's not in, I don't know that it's in New Mexico. It's maybe oh, Arizona gosh. Or... You know, I, I even brought a candy bar for where we get it right and, and some cookies. No one? No one? No? Okay. Well, anyway, see, this it tells you, I mean, I am from Amarillo. So this is Amarillo, Texas. And so... Uh, so Amarillo, you may or may not know, uh, I'm from Amarillo. Uh, Amarillo is in the northern part of, uh, cent uh, of Texas. Monos knows where Mon uh, uh, Mayo, uh, sorry, um, Amarillo is. Uh, but you know, it's known for a number of things, uh, but one of the things that it is known for is the Big Texan Steak Ranch. And uh, the Big Texan is where you can buy a steak for, that's 72 ounces, and if you eat it within an hour, it's free. Um, and so, uh, but the most interesting thing is that the, the record for eating the steak is actually held by the woman on the far right. That's, that's Molly. Molly weighs 125 pounds and she actually can eat not one, but two 72 on steaks 
in 15 minutes. Google it, just <laughs> Google it, you don't believe me, okay? So it's nine pounds of steak, it's actually incredible. But the, the point of this is that uh, I, I wanted to share a little bit about myself. I, you know, I am from Texas where Manos lived there for many years. Everything is big, you know, we, we love to think big. And uh, it's, just, it's just whether it's steak, swimming pools, suburbans, you know, whatever, whatever it is, it's, it's big. And so when you have a quote, you know, that's now in the wall out here outside our conference center that you can't think big enough by one of our uh, legendary founders, uh, Bob Van Tassel. It really speaks to me and it really, I think, also reflects a lot of how we approach things in, in our practice as well as here in the foundation. And so with that in mind, uh, I'm going to share with you some of those things that we've been working on the past several years that I hope reflect uh, a little bit of this mantra. So again, I'm going to share with you a few anecdotes uh, to illustrate a few key messages, but this is an 80-year-old woman who had shortness of breath, no more EF, and she came to see me because she had this degree of MR that was probably moderate, but she was so profoundly short of breath that uh, they just couldn't believe that her MR wasn't the reason for her symptoms, and they were convinced that she needed to have something done. And so we looked at her and said, you know what, that MR is really, it's pretty unimpressive, but we're gonna study you. And this is how we studied her. Whoops, the other way. Right. So what we do, and if you don't know this already, this is done in the cath lab. We do a right heart cath, put the catheter out in the PA, and we measure the wedge pressure at rest and with exercise. And we do this with simultaneous VO2 to get the cardiopulmonary gas exchange to make sure that they are maximally uh, uh, exercised. And we'll often throw in an echo to make sure there's no valve disease that's either at rest or apparent. And this is really the way to get at, is your shortness of breath cardiac, is it pulmonary, or is it deconditioning or something else? And, 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 and to illustrate, this is the patient that I just mentioned. This woman with this, these vague symptoms, um, we knew she had some type of shortness of breath, just didn't know what. But if you look at her on the left-hand side here, her wedge pressure at rest, totally normal. It's 10 to 12. But with 40 watts of supine exercise and her blood pressure going from 120 to 160, her wedge pressure triples. So she has low dependent diastolic dysfunction. So HEFPEF. And for those in Peters here, heart fairy doctors know that HEFPEF is very low dependent. If you raise the blood pressure, you can unmask it. But if you don't do those maneuvers, you'll never really know. And you might ask, well, doesn't the wedge pressure go up in everybody? No, it, it doesn't. And so this is cardiac dyspnea. Here's another example. This is a patient just five days ago in the cath lab. Same technique, same unexplained symptoms. And you can see here, in this woman, her wedge pressure is normal at rest and it's normal with exercise. But her RER was over 1.1. She was short of breath. This is what I'm feeling, doctor. Well, it's not your heart. And so it's a great way to differentiate the two. Okay, so if you have somebody, think about that. Now, you might ask, well, what can you do with that? Well, we're gonna manage the HEFF as you normally would, but there are also some new technologies uh, that are out there that help offload the pressures in the left atrium. And one of these, is a shunt device, and there are multiple different shunt devices, but this is one we have here as part of a research study. This is the Corvia device. It's an atrial shunt, it's eight millimeters, and it's designed to reduce left atrial pressure when somebody needs their left atrial pressure to be reduced. And in a sham controlled randomized trial, what they found is that in those patients who got the shunt, there was less exercise induced pulmonary capillary wedge hypertension than patients who didn't. And so there's already physiological proof that unloading the left atrium with these shunts uh, is beneficial. And so this device has now moved into a pivotal US study. We have that here and we also have this device. This is a device that's made by Edwards. And this is really novel because what we do here is we go through the right internal jugular vein, we pass a catheter into the coronary sinus and we put the shunt between the left atrium and the coronary sinus. And what this does is this helps reduce the risk of paradoxical emboli because the coronary sinus has its natural drainage. And you can imagine it's very hard for a clot to travel upstream. And so there's this anchoring balloon, there's a piercing catheter, 
And in the interest of time, I'm just gonna fast forward this for you to show you how it ends up looking. Um, but this is, the, uh, this is the actual shunt here. So it's got a couple of feet. It can be recaptured, repositioned. And once you're happy with it, it's released and then flow will come through. And I'm just gonna let that play there. And then uh, also show you what it looks like. These are, these are what it looks like uh, in, the, in, in, in animals after it's been in for months. It endothelializes. And so, and then this is the result here. Okay. And so with that wire out, you can see uh, that when there's left atrial hypertension, there's gonna be this natural flow going from the left atrium down the coronary sinus. So we've treated two patients. Uh, this is our first patient. So here in the top left, you can see that piercing catheter coming from the coronary sinus into the left atrium. The top right, you, if you look very carefully, there's an hourglass stent uh, that's there. Richard took these beautiful pictures here in the bottom. You can see the, the presence of the shunt. And the amazing thing is she's Lazarus. She's completely asymptomatic. She is doing incredibly well. And she wants to be an advocate. She wants to tell everybody to get this, uh, get this done. And so, uh, so it's, uh, these, some of the data have been presented at TCT and uh, 10 sites have been uh, up and running. And it's, we just had a meeting Saturday. It's uh, very exciting, but ambulatory HEFPEF and HEFREF, uh, Peter has been a, an important collaborator with this. Uh, there's a lot of cross talk now between heart failure and structural heart disease and a lot of excitement there. So um, I'm just gonna ask, have any of you seen a patient with dyspnea recently? <laughs> okay, all right. I don't have to ask, right? Okay, but if you have one, please just think about that because there are ways we can help you. All right, so let's move on now. So here's a 74-year-old woman uh, with fatigue and, uh, and edema, and she has tricuspid regurgitation. So in the top right, you can see there, there's an aortic valve. Uh, it's a color compare view. You can see a lot of TR. Here in the bottom left, this is a four chamber view. This is the right atrium, the right ventricle. Um, and you know, nowadays we have mild, moderate, severe, and we also have massive and torrential. So there are actually five grades of TR. I won't tell you what grades of pacemaker leads cause, but, it's, uh, <laughs> but they can be associated with TR too. Uh, and so, so this is something that we're seeing uh, a lot of. And so, um, and you can see why in the bottom right, why the TR is present. There's this complete loss of coaptation. This is a septal leaflet, anterior leaflet, posterior leaflet. You can see the space there. You can see that gap. That loss of coaptation is why there's a TR in this patient. So the new uh, uh, device that's out there is the TV, uh, uh, TVRS uh, system. Uh, this is like the MitraClip, but it's been specially designed for the tricuspid valve. And the reason why that's important is because the right atrium is small and we have to be able to work in small spaces. And it's got different sleeve curves which have been rotated and uh, it's really, really quite a user-friendly system. And because of this, we often can do it somewhat similar to how a mitral clip is done. If you look in the top left, you can see the arms are positioned in the right atrium. We're getting ready to insert into the right ventricle. And then the top right, you can see we're getting ready to grasp the leaflets. And then the bottom uh, left here, uh, this is actually a bow tie. It's created by placement of two uh, clips there. And then the bottom right, you can see the residual uh, uh, TR, which is mild. Oh, sorry about that. It always seems to do that in the middle of um, presentations. It never seems when I go through my slides. Sorry about that. Richard, I swear I updated this. Remember, we talked about this. So, okay. so. Let's try this again. So in the bottom right here, uh, just residual uh, uh, mild uh, TR when we're done. And uh, so the early data uh, have been submitted uh, and are in press in Lancet. They were actually presented at London, um, but the uh, NYHA class, 80% class one, two and follow up. And the KCCQ uh, score on average is approved 15 to 20 points. And that improvement is actually irrespective of the residual TR. So even if you go from torrential to massive or massive to severe, you actually get quality of life improvement. And again, it's a, we don't quite understand all the physiology there. It's not simple changing grades. It's about renal perfusion, all the other things that go with it, but it's been actually quite impressive. And so uh, the uh, pivotal style, uh, trial is now uh, started. 
Uh, and David Adams at a New York uh, surgeon there and I are the national PIs. Uh, 80 sites uh, worldwide. Uh, Richard and I have actually trained almost 45 of these sites personally. Uh, we have another three training uh, um, uh, seminars that are planned. It's been a lot of work, been a lot of fun, and uh, very excited. And, uh, and I'll tell you, uh, we made headlines uh, because um, um, this... So there, as you can see, this is uh, August 28th. Um, this is the first three patients treated worldwide. Kate, who's back there in the audience, fabulous job getting these uh, patients in, and uh, and uh, we we're all really happy. And so, you you might imagine that there were a lot of headlines because this is the. Uh, I was gonna get this. Sorry, I'm just this is uh, this is getting a little obnoxious. Okay, so um, um, but um, you know this is the first ever pivotal clinical trial of TR. And I can't emphasize how a big of a deal that is. I mean, the first ever. And so it's, it's going to be really great to get this study done. There's a lot of excitement about this. And, uh, and, and for us to lead the way, it's been really, really uh, a pleasure. Now, there are going to be some patients who are candidates and some patients who are not. And if you just focus on the right-hand side, just look at the right-hand side and look how big that gap is. There's a physical limit to the device. It can't treat all gaps. And so when you have some patients, like this patient, there's a patient here, an 84-year-old woman who is not a candidate for, uh, for this procedure. Uh, she actually came and had this tricinch coil. And so there are other alternatives. Uh, this is a procedure in which you go through the femoral vein, uh, make a puncture, uh, place uh, an epicardial anchor connected to a tether, which is then connected to a stent in the IVC. And so this is the anchor here, you can see. And what we then do is we then pull and, and shrink the tricuspid valve annulus and improve the coaptation. And so you see here, uh, this is how it works exactly, just like the, in the animation, right? Uh, so you see here, so this is the, uh, the stent coming in. And then uh, with that, uh, there's tension on the, the cable uh, that helps reduce uh, the, the TR. And so, uh, uh, again, with the support of the foundation, the first case uh, last Tuesday. So in the top left, uh, this is us puncturing uh, through the right atrial appendage. We do that to create, to insert CO2. So there's CO2 here in the pericardial space. And then uh, we find that space in the top right uh, with a catheter that punctures to put that epicardial anchor into that space. In the bottom left, we certainly want to avoid the right coronary artery. So we're monitoring where that is. And then we connect the whole thing to a stent uh, in the IVC. And uh, these are the acute results in our first patient. This is uh, number 23 worldwide. And you can see uh, Richard took these beautiful pictures. The area uh, was 15.8, went to 12.5, and the diameter 4.5 to 3.8. And so, so it still remains to be seen how they're going to do. Uh, very early technology, but an option for patients who don't have other options. And then uh, we're going to switch over in the last few minutes to talk about mitral. And so um, uh, many of you are familiar <coughs> with our, of our experience with uh, severe MR in patients with uh, severe MAC. Uh, you can see here at the top, um, just absolutely horrific uh, MR and prohibitive uh, mitral anion calcification. Uh, the way we do these, and uh, this is um, our very first time inflating valves that look like this. So what do I do? I, I give the catheter to Mario. And I say, Mario, inflate. <laughs> Of course, you could, you, you could hear a pin drop in the room as he's inflating that balloon. It was impressive. But we, we often would dilate these valves and put in, uh, and then we put in the tendine, and then the, uh, you can see there's no MR. And the right side, these images, John uh, took beautiful CT images showing how that valve fits uh, in that mitral annulus. And the great thing is that uh, we had a publication in Jack, and the very first patient in the world it took months, about six months of um, paperwork to get done. It was a compassionate use. There are a lot of naysayers. It was very, very difficult. Foundation did an amazing job supporting this. We've now done 16 such patients worldwide. France, Germany, all over the U.S. have followed our exact methods, and there have been no deaths, no MR, and uh, great outcomes. And, and on top of this, it's moved from compassionate use to the feasibility study. And as of a month ago, this has now moved into a pivotal US trial. 
So if you just think about it, this is a Minnesota proud moment, something that started off as a compassion use case is now on the verge of being studied to be commercially approved. And it all started right here. And so it's really, really, uh, really a proud moment. And then the final thing I'll share with you is a little glimpse into the future. And that is, is that this is a, a patient who uh, came to us. He had had mitral clip done at Mayo and uh, didn't have a great result. And you can see in the top right, uh, if you look carefully, one of the clips is attached and one is detached and he had a lot of MR. And he was stuck because he was not surgical. We couldn't do more clip and uh, we didn't know what to do with him. It was a very, very difficult situation, but he came to us for an opinion because we, he thought we could be creative. And so what we did is we actually did a uh, replacement despite this. And the way this is done is we have two catheters in the left atrium. We lasso around the remaining tissue bridge. And then here, this is a cornea wire in which a portion of the wire has been denuded. The covering has been, the insulation has been scraped off to create this V. And that V is then pulled, pulled against the uh, bridge of the uh, remaining tissue bridge and it's used to cut that bridge. And so you can see that there's the cut and uh, it's done with uh, electrocautery. And then right next to it is a tendine valve ready to go. So Ben's son has, a, has already cut down to the apex and has a valve all ready to go and as soon as you cut that tissue bridge in which there may be some uh, uh, significant MR, he starts deploying the valve. And this is uh, uh, done successfully. You can see here, the left-hand image is the eclipse with the uh, valve in place, and then there's no MR. And uh, since this is, again, first in the world, uh, done last uh, October, there have now been six patients treated worldwide following the same methods. And uh, we actually have a seventh case that just got approved to be done uh, yesterday. We'll be doing that uh, very, very soon. So again, very, very uh, um, uh, uh, amazing things to do and showing that uh, replacement with a transcatheter after repair is now, now possible. So in summary, um, whoop, sorry. Think of new ways of treating dyspnea. Think of ways of diagnosing them. Think about TR, uh, these new catheter-based options. The 109 and MAC experience has just been absolutely extraordinary. Um, uh, and think about uh, treating patients with uh, repair and replacement from a transcatheter point if they have mitral disease. And then uh, with that, I'll put in a plug here. Manos is gonna go next, but Manos and I uh, are among a, a couple of course directors that run this meeting uh, every summer now. Uh, this summer, uh, this July will be the fourth annual. Uh, it's a wonderful users meeting uh, and uh, lots of great learnings uh, out there. We have lots of grant support for uh, scholarships and funding for those of you who uh, may need to support to attend. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Well, thanks very much again. It's a pleasure uh, to present this morning about coronary artery disease, which actually is at the basis of a lot of the things that uh, come downstream in terms of electrical and heart failure as well. So complexity is something that we see all the time, especially here at uh, Minneapolis Heart, and has to do with the anatomy, the patient's hemodynamics, and comorbidities. And this is not something infrequent. This is one of our um, previous summer interns who did this uh, work about how often do we actually do complex cases in the cath lab. And interesting enough, more than half of the cases we do are actually have one degree of complexity, either left mains, bifurcation, calcium, CTOs. So this is not something uh, out of the ordinary, something we do every single day. 
treating those patients requires a lot of collaboration. So apart from the interventionalist, uh, there's also a lot of work with the surgeons because many of those patients are actually coming from the surgeon. And then uh, a lot of non-invasive work imaging with um, John Lesser, John Calvacante, trying to understand better and those procedures are a little safer. But also in the heart failure, because we want to have a bailout option. Before coming here, something will go wrong. I mean, you're in a bind, nothing you can do. But here we have a lot of support. And actually by having the heart failure team look at the patients before, we often have uh, um, a backup um, plan if things don't go well. So a lot of uh, work in terms of research done by the um, uh, CCAD, uh, Bhavan Arangan joined us a few months ago, Paul Morley, Iosip Xenogiannis, uh, Vivem, Willis, and Konakopoulos are our fellows. So a lot of work in terms of the studies I will show you down the line. And everything we do uh, focuses on the clinical work, uh, but try to support this both on the research and the education side. So here are some of the studies that are currently happening in um, the Center of Complex Disease, and I'll just go briefly describe some of them. The first is the Progress CTO Registry. That's uh, um, probably the largest, um, one of the largest city registries in the world. It's now more than 6,000 patients. Um, it used to be a US registry, now it's expanding uh, in um, uh, Europe. Um, there's a the middle, uh, uh, middle East and now India coming as well. So we're trying to make it a global collaboration. Some of the new investigators that came in on board. And these are some of the papers, so 47 papers so far. This is clearly the, the most published registry in the world. It's actually benchmarking in terms of what can be done we now have 90% success here and many other um, high-end places around the world. 3% complication rate. So CTO-PCI has really been transformed. It's not what used to be a niche application in a few centers. Now it's done much more commonly with uh, fairly good results. Now, CTOs are happening very often in the setting of previous coronary bypass. And this is what happens after bypass. Uh, you do have some remodeling of the bypasses and the veins eventually develop some lesions that can get worse and eventually become included. And the, and the question is, can we block this process before they get to the stage of nothing can be done? We do have the study called ASAP-SVG, trying to use PCSK9 inhibitors, alirocumab at patients who come to the cath lab and have moderate lesions, and then see if that changes the plaque development in the saphenous vein graft wall over the next year. Uh, this is done in several sites. Actually, this is one of the first um, studies where MHIF is actually the coordinating center. And um, um, it's been enrolling well. This is from the investigator meeting at uh, TCT. Uh, we have a we call about 140 patients and we're slowly getting there. Another study along the same lines is, can we do this earlier on? Can we actually give PCSK9 immediately after coronary bypass? And that might actually prevent the development of uh, significant lesions and this is a study called Newton Cabbage. Actually, we're running the imaging part of this in the CTA to look at the volume. Uh, the, uh, the PIs are actually in Canada. But the goal here is to prevent the process in the beginning and prevent the formation of atherosclerosis in the saphenous vein graft wall. Access is one of the favorite topics in every uh, utilization meeting. I know um, Steve Bradley wants us to do more radial access and it makes sense because it, it makes things more efficient. At the same time, it can be more challenging and there are some, ch some issues with uh, support needing different catheters. And there's, there's been a lot of smaller studies, but not major um, large study in all comers to see if radial versus femoral works. And thanks to the uh, 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 anonymous donor for the foundation, we're able to launch um, the rebirth trial, which is randomizing femoral to radial. But as you many, many of you know, femoral done here is different than in 99.9% .9 of other places around the country and the world because we do ultrasound in every single case. We do um, do angiogram immediately after. We do use closure devices in the majority of patients if clinically stable. So this is a study that will actually uh, randomize uh, more than 3,000 patients into um, state-of-the-art femoral versus radial access and see how that uh, pans out in terms of uh, clinical outcomes. This is another study on science CTO. This is the first uh, um, uh, SAM control. There's one study called Orbita that has been in the press for the last two years in which we actually get the people in the cath lab and they randomize them to either undergo the, the real procedure or a some procedure, get access, get the picture, but not actually open the artery. And we're doing the same thing in CTO, which as you can imagine is not an easy thing to do for logistically as well as um, uh, getting the evaluations properly. But this is the best way to assess the efficacy of an intervention. And this is um, uh, planning to enroll 142 patients around the world. And again, that will be another study that uh, run by the foundation. 
many new other studies that are coming up right now. One is the clear CTO study. Um, we do have a system in which we take the X-ray and we fuse it with the CT images. And then we can have live guidance during the CTO PCI. And based on some preliminary data created here, we, we now are launching a study with um, uh, several sites trying to randomize patients to either go CT guided versus not CT guided and see if that improves the success of crossing as well as the efficiency. We now do have success of 90%, so it's hard to make it much more than that, but if we can make this faster, that can be logistically a, a good thing to do. Also, there, is, um, a lot of, uh, there are a lot of patients with bypass grafts that come in and they can be challenging to treat or the bypass keeps on failing. And the question is, can we actually open the native coronary artery instead? And the answer is, uh, in many patients, yes but there's a full uh, proposed trial we have right now in final stages to try to address whether this is true or not. And finally, a similar study to look at the left ventricular function and can we actually make it improve. The studies done so far didn't show benefit, but they were done in people with normal ejection fraction where you might not expect it to be much, much better. Um, this is the example of the co-registration, CT images fused with coronary angiography. Uh, we'll be launching in the next, uh, in the next year uh, a study called Soundbite. It's a new system that can penetrate through calcium and that will be one of the PIs in which uh, we actually try to uh, penetrate and undergrade versus have to go retrograde and do more complex parts of the procedure. This is some from the center. So last year, 87 papers. This year, 54 so far. Uh, key, uh, key papers like a big randomized trial in vein grafts, uh, this year we published the first global consensus on CTO intervention, more than 100 operators from 50 countries. Um, a lot of work on techniques um, on uh, CTO intervention, can we have cross post first? So many, many different uh, things that are going on thanks to the hard work of the fellows, including uh, the clinical fellows, you know, Mike Megali has been tremendous, uh, Mohamed Omer and Alison Holm from last year. This is from uh, TCT, uh, many great presentations. And uh, this is the presence around the world, several live cases, as well as um, uh, case demonstrations. But another thing that uh, in the complex uh, CAD center is trying to educate people, both locally as well as international. And apart from the live cases that have been going on, um, we have a lot of um, uh, cases uploaded online, as well as uh, in books. And um, it's interesting, most places I go, they don't know anything about the papers, but most people know about the videos and they actually um, use them before they do a case just to see how to do a technique and how can they apply it locally. So it's something that is fairly rewarded, more than half a million hits and, uh, and growing. And actually, we're in the final stages now. The first draft is written for the manual of PCI to complement the CTO manual that uh, we hope to, we, it should be available uh, middle of uh, next year. Um, there's also a big event about um, uh, educated patients, thanks to the foundation, um, life after stand, with another one to come uh, about the life after bypass. And this is an outline of the steps of intervention and how to address one by one, and this is um, coming up soon as well. So to summarize, <clears throat> coronary disease remains what we do most of the day. Uh, it's most of the people we, do, we see do have some degree of coronary artery disease, and now we can achieve very good outcomes in some of the very complex patients. CTOs, 90% success. It's not 100%, one out of 10 doesn't work, but the majority does work with significant clinical benefit. Uh, bifurcations, left mains, hemodynamic support, we have a lot of options for those patients. And research and education can actually help bring those um, home and make the clinical uh, outcomes even better. Thank you very much.
Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think it's, it's happening already. I mean, I, you know, I used to do you know, some tower and clip. I mean, I have stopped since coming here because the reality is so much work to do on this field that there's no time to do. And you don't want to do it in the basic level. Like you want to do it at the high level. I mean, it makes no sense for me to do a case when you and Paul are here, do a clip. I mean, why? I mean, you can do 10 times better job. So it makes sense for you to do this. I do my CTOs, you do your clips, and the better outcomes are happening. I think even in other parts of the world, this realization is slowly kicking in. There are a few places now that have CTO operators doing the full spectrum of clips and, uh, and, and structural. Uh, I don't know about the structural. I suspect it's a similar similar. No, situation. I, I think it's a really valid question. I, I do think so because, um, I mean, well, the hospital trilogy and the board exams all require your mentors to have done some type of interventional things. I don't do it just for that, but that's the reality of how uh, the current U.S. system is set up is that uh, the board interventions you have to have done a certain type of status, not number of times. But I'll tell you, it, it's going to actually become even more complex, not more straightforward. And the reason why is because five years ago, when I did my first microbus, it took four hours. Taverns would take half a day. We used to be able to schedule only two a day. And that would be five or six taverns in a day. I actually can do a tower faster than most people do. And, and because, because it takes about 30, 45 minutes, right? It's not that it's not that it's not that it's 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 our operator skill level, it's just that the procedure has evolved. And I'm going to bet with all your YouTube videos, it's going to make some procedures, some procedures go faster too. And so if you look at the, the average practitioner out there, and this is something that's well known, any procedure that takes more than an hour and a half is not commercially viable. And, and, and so any procedure that takes an hour or less, everybody will do. And so that's really what it comes down to. If you have a CTO or whatever, you can do it in an hour. It'll be everywhere. Uh, um, and so I think it actually is going to become more complex uh, than it is uh, than, than currently. Is there a central I see patient by best surgery, I think Amy is one of the things you might do with while instead of calling you directly, is there a way I can right now I can call the structural heart as a, a nurse in the foundation and get the information and things will happen? Is there a central way to get a hold of you without actually having to get a hold? We should create one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, the, the reality is I think Paul done a phenomenal job in terms of organizing the system and having outside. Uh, in, our, in the coronary side, it's a little less structured, and we're working on making it a little more organized. I'll give you a summary. <laughs> <laughs> can, I just, can I comment on that for studies? Um, you know, because that's something we've just created as a pool within Epic. Because what I was finding was I can't remember which is the study coordinator for the root study versus the AccuSage versus the NASA. I just don't know, but I know I think we've got a study on this. So we've created a pool within Epic that you can send it to, and the coordinators within the foundation will get it to the right people. I don't remember the name of it. Specialization. You know, I think this group, uh, Bob Hauser at FedEx, was in the mid 90s, the decision was made to, to actually become more specialized, in other words, so that everybody wasn't a cardiologist that did all things. You know, I, at that time, back 20 or 30 years ago, we used to have invasive and non invasive, right? And that was kind of how it was described. And then there was this other group called electrophysiology. But if you look at all of our sections, you look at advanced imaging, we got guys that do MR, we got guys that do CT. You look at uh, uh, echo, we have you know our interventional echo guys, we have uh, standard reading echo guys. In electrophysiology, we're very segregated. You know, we have people that do read extractions, we have complex ablation people. I mean, I think the demand has been for all of us actually because of levels of expertise and repetition to actually do that. And we're very fortunate here because we actually have enough volume and enough people, and oh, by the way, enough support from all of the different areas, including research and clinical, that we're actually able to do all of that. So 
you know, it's 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 like it's exciting to get up in the morning and come to work here with all of you guys. That's what I, or all you people. That's what I would say. It's just exciting because there's all kinds of stuff happening and and it's uh, it's it's just fun. You know, I mean, there's the, the next challenge you're thinking about. Geez, you know that we're doing that already. We're already doing it. So it's it's very exciting for all of us. And even keeps old guys coming back. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Go. Great. Well, thanks again. Thank you very much.